Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is home ownership consultant Ross Kay from the WealthyHomeowner.ca, Canada's authority on home ownership. Welcome back to the show, Ross. Thanks for having me back, Jim. Ross, June 1st marks a stiffer tougher stress test for insured mortgages was it necessary uh was it necessary yeah i believe it was necessary jim it was necessary uh probably way back in 2007 2006 2007 so the way that home buyer behavior works and the way that the home selling and home trading infrastructure directs them uh, means that these rules should have been, it should have been implemented a long time ago. Worst case scenario, Jim, they should have been implemented in 2009, as we were coming out of the uh, the Great Recession, or I mean, the American housing market was uh, was still in their Great Correction. But in Canada, as you know, they leveraged the housing market. When they came out of that, that's when these rules should have applied. But uh, just like COVID. When panic sets in, governments make irrational decisions on the exuberance they have to try to solve problems that don't really exist. What the difference this time, though, Jim, is this. Last time when the OSFI first implemented the mortgage qualification rate, MQR as we call it, uh, they, 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 set, they brought the rule into place at a period of the trading cycle when they shouldn't have. What I mean is is that you don't change a home trading infrastructure anywhere but in the trough of a trading cycle. Because if you make any changes uh, from uh, the end of a trough to the enter- entry of the next trough, you have unintended consequences. Many of our listeners will have heard the term unintended consequences, except no one can explain why those unintended consequences happened. How can the OSFI effectively reduce the buying power, so-called, as the press has reported, amateur housing analysts have reported, reduce the buying power of Canadians by 20%, but the average price increases 25%. How is that possible? How can we limit the amount of money that a family is able to spend buying a home, but at the same time, the average price increases? Well, if you implement a policy outside of the trough of a trading cycle, depending on where you implement it, the average purchase price is going to change. In other words, if you change this uh, when first-time buyers are not entering the market, when trade-up buyers are are commanding a higher share of the sales, trade-up buyers are commanding a higher share of the sales, and the few first-time buyers that are actually buying gets chopped in half because you institute a rule, the average purchase price is going to increase accordingly. So even though the price of a home didn't increase month to month, the average price, the average purchase price rose because you cut out those first-time buyers. If on the second form of a policy, you you moved it while the uh, trading cycle was cresting, for the sake of the argument, in other words, when home buyers are already peak share of sales is going towards the most expensive homes being purchased in those months, and you cut out the lower uh, qualified trade-up home buyers, only the richest people, only the people buying the most expensive homes have their share of sales increase. What happens? The average purchase price jumps again. Now, in May of, back in May, actually we'll say March, March of 2020, when the lockdown first started, the trading cycle at that time was ending. We were heading towards a tr- towards a trough. You know you're heading towards a trough when house price acceleration is at its maximum. 
just the opposite to what everybody thinks. Because the share of sales, disproportionately, is towards the most expensive homes in the neighborhood. First-time buyer share of sales, where they're buying the cheapest homes, is at their lowest. The people at the end of the sales chain buying their most expensive homes are at their peak. If you lock those people out and you don't let them start buying again for a month to two months, all of a sudden when those people jump into the market, you have phenomenal increases in average house price because the average purchase price is substantially higher. The average home that is being purchased is substantially more expensive. The average house, remember folks, is never the same month to month because the average buyer is never the same month to month. This rule, Jim, is coming in at the perfect time. Mr. Rudin locked out. Mr. Rudin does not have access to the trading cycle, so I know in my heart that he locked out. He is going to leave his position at the OSFI finalizing a rule that is going to standardize the Canadian home trading infrastructure in a way that it has never been standardized before because there has been no standard. This is the first time since I can only speak back to 1980. This is the first time since 1980 where the manipulation of the Canadian public by realtors, bankers, and mortgage brokers and amateur housing analysts will no longer be possible. This is the very, Mr. Rudin is implementing a rule at a time where we have already reached our trough. Okay, first time buyers are requ required right now to re-enter the market in a larger share of sales just in order for the current rate of sales to stay the same. If they don't enter in enough numbers, sales will begin to decline. When sales decline, the multiplicity of sales, which causes the average purchase price to rise disproportionately, never exists. Why was this rule necessary? Greed by Canadian banks is, is literally unbelievable. Now, if you've studied the banks by watching home buyers and how the banks manipulate rates to encourage a behavior in home buyers, only then do you come to an understanding of what the banks are actually doing. We would see a housing market, Jim, begin to slow down, and we would hear the banks, one or two of the banks of the big six, like this has gone on since the, since the uh, 90s, folks, since uh, the first mortgage discounts first started applying. And the banks would say, oh, rates are going to, great, rates are going to rise. They would say that to motivate first-time buyers to enter the market. If you can motivate first-time buyers to enter the market, you're going to have another two to three to four months of increasing sales because of the law, the multiplicity of sales. If you buy a house, if, if, if Joe buys a $100,000 house, the $100,000 owner, owner moves to a $200,000 house, the $200,000 moves to a $300,000 house, the $300,000 owner moves to a $400,000 house. You move over the course of those four months between $100,000 to $400,000, and all of those sales combined close um, on the fifth or sixth month from the first time, from when the first time buyer purchased the first home. Now, these windows uh, lengthen and decrease. There is some seasonality to that uh, because of the behavior of all of the players in the home trading infrastructure, but that's how it works. Mr. Rudin has enacted a rule right now where first-time buyers, because Christina Freeland has mirrored that rule change with CMHC, all buyers, every home buyer dealing with a major Canadian lender, and that means the trust companies will pretty much follow this same uh, pattern, by the way, folks. It will only be the MIC mortgage, uh, mortgage corporations, the private lenders who don't follow this. They're all going to be playing by the same rules. That means the banks can't manipulate the public. The games that they've been playing during this lockdown have been eradicated by the OSFI. The five-year posted rate by the six major Canadian banks is sitting at 4.79%. The banks haven't moved that. They didn't move it for a reason. So even though you could get a five-year mortgage 
for 1.64%. I mean, just think of the magnitude of the spread there, folks. You're talking over a 3.5% spread between realized, realized rates and posted rates. The banks were doing that to manipulate the public again. And the moment that the market changed, they could simply raise the posted rate, and everybody would say, oh, you better act now and get use those pre-approved mortgages uh, to get into the market because if you wait too long, you're going to have to pay a higher rate and you're not going to qualify for as much money. And they could have used that to set off another series, the, uh, another, uh, another sales chain. And it may be by the time that sales chain was finished, four months from now, the economic uh, consequences of this lockdown would have uh, revealed themselves. And the bank would have had to reduce, or the Bank of Canada would have had to reduce their rates, is what the banks would believe. Mr. Rudin said, no, no, no. We're not going to allow this manipulation to go on anymore. We are setting a firm and binding rule that even your current practices that you use to manipulate this rate are going to be thwarted. Because all the major banks right now, Jim, are manipulating the intent of the rule that the OSFI instituted back in 1617. He has wiped that out. He has watched what they've done, and he said enough is enough. Now, I'm not going, he says, I'm not going to out these people. I'm not going to disclose to the to the public the unethical practices that the banks have participated in during a national pandemic lockdown, because my job is to make the banking sector safe and secure. I can't add risk by exposing these bankers uh, for the thefts that they're committing against the Canadian population. So I'm going to remain silent. But I'm going to do instead is change the rule. So the current practices used to manipulate the old rules are going to no longer apply. And that's what he's done, Jim. He has a staff. Now, I think this rule was not really needed in the sense that the Canadian public has always been very prudent in their home buying decisions, regardless of the continual insults that we read from amateur housing analysts who have no understanding what a Canadian family goes through when they're buying and owning a home. They don't understand how prudent Canadian families truly are, regardless of the price that they're paying for a home. Mr. Rudin said enough is enough. He has established a home trading infrastructure change that is going to last until some politician or some ill-informed regulator gets in a position of power where they can change it. I think this is important to say, Jim, on this issue. There was only one person, one person in Canada who had the power to do this, one person, and that was Jeremy Jeremy Rudin at the OSFI. The Bank of Canada, the governor, Tip Macklin, he could not do this. His um, predecessors could not do this. The Minister of Finance could not do this. The Prime Minister of Canada could not do this. CMHC could not do this. The only person with the power to legislate this change, mandate it, put it in writing, make it so everyone has to follow, was Mr. Rudin. And he had the will, the uh, personal willpower on the, his way out the door to, to do so. I mean, I really don't think the Canadian public has any idea what this man has done for them. Now, he is going to be falsely blamed for consequences going forward. He will be falsely blamed. All of the regular stakeholders are going to target him. They're going to blame him. They're, it's, they're going to be, the, he's going to be their excuse while they were so wrong. Oh, how did we know? We didn't know. You can't time a housing market. Oh, no. He is establishing a set of rules that going forward, if they're not changed, they're not going to be manipulated by the Canadian banks. They're not going to be manipulated by realtors, organized real estate, the chief economist at your local real estate trade association. They're not going to be able to be manipulated by amateur housing analysts who claim that they, they, they can understand what a housing market is. They're, they're not going to be able any way to escape this rule the way that it's being enacted. The moment that the spread between the posted rate and the, uh, the, the, the rate that you can actually get five year money at is 2%. And that range is above 5.25%. The banks can't play a game. The rule is 2%. If they want to play 
a game with a five-year posted rate, it's going to be attached to the 2% actual rate Canadians can borrow money at. And until that spread is reduced back to its historical norm, which is about 2%, which is why he chose 2%, the Canadian banks won't be able to manipulate you. He also instituted it, I believe, by sheer luck, at a time where there currently are um, 70,000 Canadian home sellers who own two homes. There are currently 70,000 Canadian home sellers who own two homes. He's bringing this rule change into place at the moment he's leaving his office, which just happens to be the single best moment in time that the rule could have been instituted. Ross, John, and Carlisle, Ontario asks, we currently have a household income of around $160,000 here in Ontario. Should we be looking towards Toronto with the recent increase in lending standards in that city? In other words, move from a small town into the big smoke. What was their job? Uh, They're teachers. Teachers, teachers, okay. Guy's name is John, sorry. John, okay. So, so John, here's, here, here, here is how, how, how we would discuss things with you. You've stated your income level is 160,000 household. Okay. So this is how we see it. The families, 50% of the Canadian families, those who earn above the bottom 40% of earners, household incomes, and below the top 10% occupy 50% of all households. So the bottom 40%, we don't, we're not talking about the, the next 50%, which you occupy, John, we are going to talk about, and the top 10% we're not going to talk about. Because all of this leads into how to answer this question. The middle class, which is how we describe this 50% of the Canadian uh, households, the, the ones that I, that I just mentioned. So not the bottom 40%, not the top 10%, but that 50% that exists uh for the sake of the argument, between uh, 40 and 90%. So your income is somewhere in the top 40 to 90% of the country. You're middle class. And because you're middle class, by this definition, everything in our, everything in our society is structured to remove wealth from you. Every single thing that you do is structured to take your income away from you. Taxation, you are the most highest taxed uh, group in the country. Now, why do I say that? Well, the, 40, the bottom 40% of earners, the Canadian politicians are afraid of them. They are so afraid that they won't vote for them that they will not tax them. They will, own, will not only not tax them, but they are going to have to give them things to keep them voting for them. So that 40% is, is, is no longer available to be that. The top 10% are wealthy enough that no matter what rule change the federal government puts in place to try to tax them, they're going to circumvent. The same way they've circumvented it for the last seven, since the first time income taxes were applied. They will hire lawyers. They will talk to one another. Whatever strategy works, they will maximize to minimize the amount of tax that they pay. So any rule change that they apply for that top 10% is going to be circumvented in one matter or another. That only leaves you, John, and your wife as the prime tax source for the Canadian government. Now, it's a double-edged sword for you, John, because you said you're a teacher. So here you are being paid by the taxpayer as, as a uh, as a uh, public worker, and you also happen to be a public worker who is earning in that uh, household income level where Canadian where the governments go after it. Now let me explain it to you this way: If you're buying a house, John, in Toronto, you're going to buy a house in Toronto. We have we have a something we call income efficiency. Okay, your income efficiency ratio. How much of your income do you get to keep? Well, we know the government is going to take their share of the taxes of what your earnings are, and you can structure your RSPs any way that you like. You can take your excess, any any spendable income, and buy TFSAs with it, but you've already paid tax in that money, so it really doesn't matter. The government's already got their uh, their piece of you when, when you did that. When you're buying a home, let's say you mentioned Toronto, well, the first thing I'm going to tell you is, is that you're, you're basically going to be prepaying 25 years a part of your property tax because you're going to have to pay double the land transfer tax versus had you bought in bond. You're going to pay about $32,000, $33,000 in land transfer tax. Understand, 
thousand dollars. If you're going to buy a million dollar home, you're going to be giving the homeowner about uh for uh nine hundred and nine hundred and forty thousand and you're gonna going to be giving the realtors about sixty thousand dollars. So sixty thousand dollars you're giving to the realtors. You're getting paying thirty two thousand dollars in tax, sixty thousand dollars in, in uh, realtor fees. Now we're sitting at what's that? Ninety about ninety three thousand dollars. Now remember your real estate fees when I say that, there's HST on real estate fees. You see, John, when I say that everything is designed to work against you, this is what I'm talking about. You can go to any place in Canada, including the Government of Canada's own website, and they will tell you, you don't pay any HST on a resale home. I can tell you, John, selling thousands of houses when GST was applicable, I always told my buyers, you're paying GST on a resale home, on a million-dollar home. You're going to pay about eight thousand dollars HST. That's what the number is. I don't care what anybody argues with it. When you see a, a cost line item from uh, a, a seller net sheet, you, you probably never saw one of those either because the realtors hide, are, are, hide them from the public. Um, it's probably not even practiced almost virtually any longer today. You, there's a line item that says HST pay, payable because you pay it. It's about eight thousand dollars on a resale home. Let's get back to the $93,000, so John. $93,000 you are paying in taxes and fees to acquire a home. Now, we're not really finished there because you're going to have to pay lawyer's fees. You're going to have to pay home inspection fees. You're going to have to pay maybe, if you don't have 20% down, CMHC fees. Oh, plus remember, there is provincial sales tax on CMHC default insurance. To wrap it all up, it's just easy to say you're going to spend 10% or whatever the purchase price of the home that you're buying is fees. So in other words, if you pay $120,000, you're going to uh, eat up, what's that, uh, $120,000 in, uh, in fees and taxes. That's what you're paying. Nobody tells you that, John. Nobody tells you that. They tell you you're buying a million-dollar house. That's not the truth. It's a lie. You may be signing paperwork that is created to create the illusion you're buying a million-dollar house. But when the home seller walks away with $940,000, you paid the realtor $60,000, and it's never put in writing on the contract that you're signing. Clearly, someone is playing games with you. They're directing you, John, into making a decision that you probably may not make when all the cards are laid on the table. I can tell you, John, that I can move you two streets over in this discussion, and I can save you $30,000. $30,000. Think about this, John. A hundred thousand, let's just for the sake of the argument, let's say it's just 10%. You buy a million dollar house and you're paying a hundred thousand dollars, uh, in order to buy that house. Okay? The fees, the service, there is that, you're getting 900,000 for the sake of the argument, you get $900,000 worth of real estate for a million dollar price. Okay? That's how it works. Now, you're paying, you're making, uh, 160,000, you said. So, let's just say you pay, uh, a third, a third in taxes. Because you're the target that the Canadian government can go after. You feel guilty making that money, knowing that minimum wage is $15 in Ontario. You're not affluent enough to be arrogant, arrogant enough to think that you want to get that top 10% where you don't pay the same sort of taxes. So, you're targeted. You make a hundred thousand dollars off that one sixty. You, your income efficiency ratio is a hundred thousand off a hundred and sixty thousand dollars earned. You're going to take that whole year's earnings, John, a whole year's of money that you had you had available to spend to purchase a home, and nobody's going to tell you that you're actually spending that kind of money. You're going to have to save enough money for a down payment on top of all that. I don't care how you spend it. This is the reality of how the math works. Why is all this hidden from you? John, why does no one tell you this? Why does the paperwork that you sign not have this clearly spelled out before you sign in the dotted line? Because they're afraid, John. They want to direct you to do things that are maybe in your best interest. Let me explain it to you this way, because this is the easiest way to explain it. Right now where you're earning, let's say you want to go down and buy a gallon of gas. 
So you want to buy a dollar's worth of gas. You want to buy a dollar's worth of gas. Okay, so you go down to your local gas station and, and you had, you just got paid. Well, we know that the government's going to take 33 cents of the dollar that you made because you're in the, you're, you're going to pay a third of your, your money to tax. So now the government's got 33 cents of your money. You're left with 66 cents. Okay, so now you go buy the gas. Well, in the gas, you're probably going to pay another 20, 20 cents of tax. Okay, so you're not really getting 60, um, six cents worth of gas. You're only getting 46 cents worth of gas because you pay, gotta pay 20% tax. Then you also really got to think about it, John, because that gas that you're buying, maybe that gas station is making a profit and the government's going to get another two or three cents from that dollar that you hand over. So actually the amount of gas you're getting, John, is now what? 30 cents? Getting 30 cents worth of gas? You earned a dollar, but you're only getting 30 cents worth of gas with it. Now, we're not going to talk about the employees at the store, at the gas station, uh, who are making money, who the government's going to tax. We're not talking about the property taxes that the store, the gas station has to pay, so the municipality gets taxed. But if we were to talk about this, and let's say that it's another couple cents. Let's say that it's six cents in total. Well, now you're down to 24 cents, John. You're, you're getting 24 cents worth of gas for the one dollar that you earned. Nobody ever tells you that. Nobody ever discusses it with you, John. Why? Why do they d- don't discuss it with you? Because they slip it in and they take your money when you're not watching. They have created an infrastructure of life in this country that is designed to extract the most amount of wealth out of that 50% slice that I have described for you. And you live there, John. You're in that slice. The government has just racked up, John, another $600 billion worth of debt. Who do you think is going to pay that debt off, John? It's that 50% slice of the taxpayers, the actual 50% who actually pays their weight in taxes. Well, that that can't be true. Well, if it wasn't true, this is what I would tell you. The government of Ontario, Ontario pays $15 minimum wage per hour. 15 bucks an hour is minimum wage. Okay. Why do we have tax based on the amount of money you earn instead of how much money you earn per hour? If the government truly was fair to everyone, they would say to you, we charge no tax when you're earning $15 an hour. If you want to work an extra 10 hours, you're not going to have to pay any tax because you're only making $15 an hour. That's an extra 150 bucks you can keep for yourself. Now, if you're going to make $25 an hour, we want a buck an hour from you, or we want two bucks an hour from you. You you can have the extra $8, but we want two of that. Remember, you don't have to work any longer to earn that money, so there is a benefit there for you. You're motivated to, to, to do it because it's a higher paying per hour job. But we also want to say to the guys who are working, making minimum wage, hey, if you want to go out and get another part-time job and work 60 hours, Go ahead and do it because we're not going to charge you any tax. As long as you're not making over that $15 an hour, we're not going to charge you any tax. They don't do that, do they, John? They don't. What they want to do is they say, oh, no, no, it's your income. If you're making $15 an hour and you're a hardworking person and you want to have two jobs, all of a sudden, those two jobs are going to put you into a different tax bracket and we're going to start taxing you. Kind of seems stupid to me. What my answer would be is this. You need to structure your life, John where your income is the most efficient. What that means is is that someone who's making $100,000 in one city can move to another city and they only need to be earning $65,000. Whether they work less hours or they take a lower paying job doesn't matter. The efficiency on $65,000 may be 90%, where the the efficiency on the $80,000 may only be 70%. So when you do the math, you see one crosses the other one out, and you can see things for what they really are. So when you're answering this question, John, here's how it goes. You're saying, Carlisle, well, I know that's about a 45-minute commute to Toronto. That's an hour and a half a day times five days a week. Hmm, seven and a half hours of commuting time. Interesting. That's an entire day's work you spend commuting. You're a teacher. Guess what? The government have said you don't get to write off your car. Had you been an independent uh, teaching professional who had signed an independent contractor agreement with a private 
uh, teaching facility, and you went to five different locations to teach over the course of the week, traveling the exact same amount of time, the exact same amount of gas, the exact same wear and tear in your car, you would have been able to reduce, take all those uh, costs off of your income. No, the government says, John, you're in the 50% slice that we're after. We're coming after you. We're going to try to take as much wealth away from you as possible. Well, John, it's time that you started to think about how you're going to keep more of your paycheck. We'll have more with Ross K. right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Writers, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ross K. Ross, Carol Lynn in Penticton, B.C. asks, How will the new mortgage lending rules impact the housing market in areas outside the major urban centers? Well, they're not really going to impact outside the major centers, um, Carolyn, in, in any way that's really going to be noticeable. You're not really going to be noticing that this change will not be readily apparent probably till sometime in 2023. So what's going to be happening over the next year, year and a half, will have nothing to do with this rule change. Everybody's going to blame it on the rule change. But if, if, if they were right, where they're casting blame, then why didn't the rule change of a 20% redu- reduction of buying power impact the market uh, the way that we're going to see going forward? What you need to understand is, like like how we see it. I, you know, when I, when I say this, I, I, I'm not trying to say how you should do it. Um, it. It's how we see it. So when we when we have studied home ownership, when we have studied family, When we have tracked them through their lifetime, certain things become apparent to us. Um, They're like truths. So if you're a scientist or if you're someone who studies physics, um, this is how we we approach home ownership, how we approach financial wealth, life. Um, It's really just a data-driven reality that's backed up by math. And if you can't prove it, then you should keep your mouth shut. That's how we look at it. If you were to take your income uh, right now and you look how much money that you're able to spend on housing and you look how much money you're able to spend on housing after this rule comes in to enforce, you're going to see you could afford it either, either sets. You're going to find that since millions and millions and millions of Canadian families have borrowed far more money than what you're able to borrow today to buy a house, you probably are really going to question why these rules come into, had to come into force in the first place. Well, they only had to come into force because the banks greed. Bankers' manip- manipulation of Canadian public. Canadian home buyers have always bought homes on the exact same formula for the last 50 years. They've always followed this exact same formula. That formula is not going to change based on this rule change. So out- outlying urban areas are not going to be impacted by it. What you may see is that people may begin buying, uh, first-time buyers may actually buy in enough numbers houses that are worth 5% that are 5% cheaper, okay? So right now, if they do come out in enough numbers to buy enough homes and they're spending 5% less, that's going to set off a cascading of falling house prices. Because obviously, if the average purchase price is 5% less, organized real estate has to say the average house price is 5% less. In other words, simply by, by buying cheaper homes, all homes drop in value. This is the way it works in the way up and the way that it works in the way down. What I'll tell you this, in these outlying areas, Carolyn, what's more important is interest rates. What is the lowest amount of interest that you have that you have to pay? How low can you get it? How little, as we talked in the previous episode, 
the previous uh, section here. How little of your income can you pay in interest? Think about it as a credit card, Carolyn, because this is this is really really how we look at it. You're paid you're paid a biweekly, and you know that you can get a credit card, and you're going to pay it off biweekly. You say, hey, I spend normally about a thousand dollars a month on groceries, non non essentials, fine, everything else. Our family spends about a thousand dollars. Okay, so you go get a prepaid card or a card with a limit of a thousand dollars. Now, because it's you're on a two week pay schedule, that card's only going to say five hundred dollars. So your limit's five hundred bucks. You can only spend five hundred dollars if you live by rule where you can only use that credit card to buy anything. You can only spend five hundred dollars at the end of the two weeks. You pay off the credit card, and then you got another five hundred dollars that you can spend because you have a spending limit of five hundred dollars. And everything that you buy has to go through that credit card. This actually goes back to the discussion of an efficient life. How do you structure your life to live efficiently? We're not going to discuss that now. I mean, something I wish that I had learned decades ago. I, I, I really wish that I didn't have to learn this by watching families and analyzing how they interacted with their finances. I wish that someone had a book that showed me this is the way to do it, but it didn't exist. But this credit card scenario is exactly what you're looking at with this rule parallel. You're going to be given a credit card by the bank with a spending limit. The spending limit has determined determined by the OSFI. You can't spend more than that credit limit, no matter what you want to do. The credit limit is lower than what it was two days ago. That credit limit will not go up, no matter what happens in the ensuing years. If interest rates go to zero, Carolyn, guess what? Your credit limit is not going to go up. You're only going to be able to buy the same price of home that your income qualifies for today, unless your income goes up. What you, what you have an opportunity, Carolyn, is that in the next 10 to 15 to 20 years, assuming uh, organized real estate gets defrocked and all of the myths get exposed for what they are, um, a stable home trading infrastructure. For the first time in recorded uh, modern history, you're going to be able to formulate a life unlike was ever possible before. You're going to have a degree of security and certainty that only the bankers themselves had previously had. When you look at this rule change, Carolyn, don't listen to all the naysayers who, who say how it's bad. Look, we are honest. We know that this rule is too extreme. We know that Canadian home buyers when counseled correctly or not directed into making bad decisions, don't make bad decisions. We know that homeowners, the vast majority of home buyers from 1980 till 2021, covering tens of millions of transactions, those home buyers made sound, prudent, rational choices. It's only when the greed of the real estate community, the banking community gets involved that they direct home buyers in decisions they probably would not otherwise have made. What's changing in the outlying areas and changing in the cities is that the manipulation of the Canadian public is being thwarted by the OSFI. The OSFI is reducing your risk the same way that they've reduced the risk to the banks for decades. What you have to do is you have to be sure that anything that you're doing in a housing market takes this consideration uh, into play. Because the worst thing you want to be doing is buying into a market before the new rules are realized as no longer being able to be manipulated by Canadian banks. The outcomes that you're going to see in the coming months are real. These are outcomes that are uh, a consequence of the of the pre the 2017 forward period. Okay, though all of the reality of house price uh, house prices is going to come home to roost. Don't be fooled by people who can't supply you with the data. I've already heard it today. Home sales in Calgary up 174 percent or something like that. Okay, price is up 16% in Calgary. I've already heard it today. Well, guess what, folks? When a whole bunch of first-time buyers are leaving the market, sales begin to decline. That's right, folks. 
174% gain is actually a decline in sales. What happens when that decline happens at that period is peak house price growth. The only way you get a 16% increase in average purchase price in Calgary in an economy like that, that exists in Alberta is that at first time buyers have left the market. Just might be Calgary is a little bit different. Oh, and don't forget, isn't this May of 2021? Didn't May of 2021 end on a Monday? Hmm. Did that mean all of the homes that were sold in the last, firm, firmed up in the last few days of May get reported to the real estate board on the Monday? Did that mean that sales were pulled forward? Sales were pulled forward from April into May? Is that really the reason why seasonally adjusted home sales were reported as falling coast to coast? And now there's going to be a boost in sales in May? Oh, all of those real estate analysts out there who have something to say about that are getting a real lifetime view of the housing market. The best thing is, is that Calgary has reports the data is available publicly for everybody to see before it ever gets reported. You can check the last two days of the month in May this year against the last few days of the month last year. You can see the percentage change that's taken place versus the percentage change that took place during the entire month. That, Carolyn, is what the real consequence is of the OSFI. The truth is about to be revealed in real time. Ross, we have a question from John in Calgary. He says, the real estate industry here reported sales were up 178% in Cowtown in May. Prices were up 16%. Our economy clearly does not support these kind of prices. Should we trust those figures? There, I just discussed it, right? I just discussed this with, in answering Carolyn's question. So, John, there you go. If you listen to Carolyn's answer, you're going to hear the answer. There are sales from April that were pulled forward into May by, by the way that reporting days line up with the business practices of the local realtors. If you check the breakdown in sales, you're going to see, because they do publish these charts, they do it in a price breakdown, the share of sales going to the cheapest homes is at a reduced level this month. If you compare it to last year's sales, you're going to see there's a substantial difference. The, if you also compare, this is this is great, John. Um, if you compare uh, April's price and May's price, you're going to find they're almost identical. I mean, in terms of real estate stats number, they are identical. Okay, but I think they're like a thousand bucks, probably like a thousand bucks out. Okay, that's because the sales peak happened right in the middle of those two months. And the carry forward of sales from April mitigated a little tiny bit the difference between the two. Listeners uh, should understand, when a real estate board moves 300 sales, so for the sake of the argument, uh, 10% of the sales from one month to the next or from one month backwards, because it works on both, it works both ways to a certain degree. In other words, when you're comparing year over year single month comparisons, these shifts, uh, can appear to, can appear, not appear, they, uh, actually work. So the month can move, could be beneficial or sacrific, sacrificial. April in this year, it was a little tiny bit, um, beneficial from February and, and sacrificial for May. So it was a, a net, um, a net beneficial month, just not to the same degree that May was. This is why we, when we tell, we tell, uh, the public, if, if you want to listen to a real estate board, or if you, or if you want to listen to some statistic by someone who regurgitates real estate board, uh, stats, uh, who, who doesn't have any understanding how you've got to read these numbers, you're just going to be, be fooled. Because no two months in a year-over-year comparison are identical. You can't actually compare any two months year-over-year. Um, you would have to go back several years to be able to have a comparable month to this uh, this May. 
and then we would actually have to see if it occurred uh, if it and if it occurred in 2013, 2014, and 2015, it wouldn't be have been comparable anyways, because in those years we start first started counting for sale by owners, which uh, reached a peak in uh, 2016. Uh, the double and triple and quadruple and sectuple reporting of single listings in inventory counts peaked in uh, 2016, I believe, 2015, 2016, I have to, can't remember off the top of my head. So when you're trying to compare those two numbers, you really can't do it. This is why when we see these charts where they say inventory levels from 2010 to 2011, and they, they show inventory levels peaking in uh, 2015, 16, uh, and then dropping off. Well, the reason for that is the drop-off is because the Canadian Real Estate Association was caught multiple counting single, single listings, and they started to get the data from the local real estate boards that were, double, that were producing these double counts, and they removed them. It wasn't that actual inventory dropped that, by that magnitude. It's just that they corrected their counting, and because they didn't want to admit that they lied in those other years, they just kept quiet, and they let you believe that the inventory levels dropped. There are people actually investing hundreds of millions of dollars based on these, these, these charts. This is the truth. There are people who actually, corporations who actually buy data from re, uh, uh, re, re, uh, bundled MLS stats from other parties who are making multi-million dollar decisions, hundreds of millions of dollars of decisions, um, based on this, this belief of inventory count. And, it, and it's insane that anyone thinks. You can go back and look at organized real estate's own legislation with the Competition Bureau. They had to start accepting for sale by owners in 2013. By July of 2013, that started to ramp up. Tom Free uh, thought, thought that they were in a gold mine. So they got bought out by the Yellow Pages. Yellow Pages, two or three years later, oh, wait a second, we really can't make any money on that. These, 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 it doesn't make sense. We thought we could make money, but these counts that clearly are in these charts aren't right. So they sold the purple bricks. Purple bricks couldn't make any money on it, so now they've become a full, a full uh, commission charging real estate broker. These things all changed. So when you're looking at these things, John, this is the context that you have to be looking at them in. Unless you have, unless you have someone who has studied how, uh, MLS systems for decades and someone who is competent enough to understand how you have to adjust the numbers in order to have an apples over apples comparison, you're always going to be misled. You're being misled in Calgary today. Marianne Lurie, the chief economist at CREB, has been caught multiple times misleading the public. Multiple times. First of all, they started adding the Edmonton sales in the Calgary. I think we talked about this in the show years ago here in Howe Street. Then the following year, Edmonton started getting all those sales counts. So, what happens when you move sales, when you start counting, when you've been counting sales in Calgary that actually existed in Edmonton, you inflated Calgary's numbers. When you add those numbers, you quit counting them in Calgary, and you start counting them back in Edmonton, based on a calendar year, it inflates that following year's numbers in Edmonton. And if you're not adjusting those numbers, you believe this happened. You believe what's reported in the newspaper. You believe, you actually believe this happened. Sales are identical year over year. But simply by counting the sales back in Edmonton, all of a sudden you get a year-over-year -year gain. This is how you're being manipulated with the Calgary Real Estate Board this month. The same type of deception based on a bad reading of MLS data by people who are unqualified who read the MLS data because they have never worked in a home trading infrastructure selling enough homes where you have even the opportunity to have learned this. That's, John, is why you are going to hear houses, housing prices, Shot up in May, better than April, and housing prices hit an all-time high. Well, there you go. You're being manipulated by organized real estate, just as everybody else in this country has been for the last 40 years. Ross, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thanks for having me on, Jim. My guest has been Ross K., home ownership consultant at thewealthyhomeowner.ca. If you have any questions for Ross, you can send them to info at housestreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at House Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening.
comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.